So welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Barry Mulefolder, who's come down from Stanford University. Uh, Barry, uh, Barry uh, did a PhD in physics at the University of Rochester uh, and then uh, was a National Research Council postdoc uh, at NIST, where he uh, extended his work uh, from his doctoral thesis on computer modeling, fabrication and, and test of thin film squid sensors. Uh, he then uh, joined the uh, Gravi Gravity Probe B project uh, at Stanford University where he co-led the development of the Gyroscope London Moment readout group, which I'm sure we're going to uh, learn more about that in today's talk, followed by a uh, payload and spacecraft test and acceptance as program technical manager. Uh, following the completion of the on-orbit science data collection, he's led data analysis effort as the Gravity Probe B project manager. Today he's going to talk to us about Gravity Probe B, uh, what they found, uh, and uh, the legacy of that uh, mission. So if you'll join me in welcoming Barry. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to, to be with you here today to uh, talk to you about uh, Gravity Probe B. Uh, a program that I've worked on since 1984. And actually, I'm a, a newcomer by GPB standards because the uh, program started in 1962 or 1963. So it has the uh, honor or uh, whatever view you have of it as the <laughs> longest running stand, uh, NASA program in, in NASA uh, history, um, science program. The uh, picture you see here was taken uh, in April of 2004. It's a picture looking north uh, along the California coast uh, of uh, the GPB uh, spacecraft on top of a Delta II rocket uh, ascending uh, from Vandenberg Air Force Base um, headed south uh, to begin the, uh, the mission. I'll be telling you now about uh, the, the testing of uh, general relativity, starting with the challenge that almost all tests of general relativity face, and that is that you start with a, um, an, a force gravity that's small, it's um, weaker than the, uh, the nuclear forces and electromagnetic forces, and, and when you're looking for the uh, perturbations due to uh, general relativity, they're smaller still. Um, the scaling of general relativity terms goes as uh, the gravitational constant g times uh, the mass of the object uh, divided by c squared r. And, and for any um, solar system test, that scaling is small, and, and so the tests are difficult. Nonetheless, uh, there have been tests. Einstein proposed three. The first that um, uh, really uh, shot him to the uh, forefront of the public uh, view and, and understanding was the def light deflection uh, during a solar eclipse. Here's you, here you see the, uh, some of the hardware that was used in 1919 um, in uh, Sobral, Brazil to, uh, to measure the deflection of starlight. Um, Additional tests were uh, envisioned starting in about 1960 when new technologies came along that actually enabled the probing of these very subtle effects. Um, and um, in addition, we are uh, looking forward to uh, the future with gravitational wave astronomy. I think, in fact, next um, week there'll be somebody talking about that uh, subject here. And uh, I encourage you all to attend. It's uh, a fascinating area of, uh, of astronomy. So the GPB mission concept is shown here. You take a 
nearly perfect gyroscope. You placed it in a perfect, nearly uh, circular orbit about the Earth in a north-south uh, orientation. And if you had a perfect gyroscope, the spin axis of the gyroscope, remember a gyroscope is nothing more than a spinning mass. Um, the spin axis would remain fixed forever. It would just point in whatever direction you set it up in and, and that would uh, be the end of it. It wouldn't be very interesting. However, according to uh, general relativity, there's two effects, the frame dragging effect and the geodetic effect that will cause the spin axis of the gyroscope to move ever so slightly. Um, and uh, to give you a, an idea of, of just how slight I, I mean, um, the, the larger of the two effects, the geodetic effect, uh, has an amplitude of 6,600 um, milliarc seconds. And a milliarc second is the angle of subtended by a human hair when viewed from some 20 miles. So imagine looking from one side of the hair to the other at a distance of 20 miles. That's the precision that we want to measure these effects to. And that's really what's made this uh, such a challenge. But um, general relativity is not just these very subtle effects. If you look out into uh, the universe, um, one sees astrophysical uh, manifestations of uh, even the smaller of the two effects, the frame dragging. These are some recently released pictures from, um, from NASA, from the Hubble Space Telescope, showing jets, which are um, fascinating objects. And, and, and these jets, with enormous energy outputs, are uh, powered by the frame dragging effect. So we're talking about things that play a significant role where gravitational fields are, are much greater than they are on um, the Earth. So this tells you really why GPB is, is such a, a challenge. The, the best gyroscopes on Earth uh, are, have um, drift rates in the 10 to the minus 5 degrees per hour or worse. Um, and, and these drift rates are the, due to things other than relativity. These are just imperfections in the construction of the, of the device. The, the um, relativistic, relativistic effects are in the 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9 range degrees per hour. And the GPB gyroscope, uh, we'd like to, to do very much better than that. And so pushing down these, uh, these disturbing effects is uh, a real challenge. Nonetheless, here is raw GPB data uh, taken from, from 2005. And we see right away that the spin axis orientation of the gyroscopes over time, uh, over the course of the uh, one year uh, uh, duration, actually do shift. If, if there were no relativity, the spin axis orientation would just be a flat line. Uh, it would just be fixed at a certain spot and that would be it. But clearly we see that things are shifting. Um, and, and so um, this confirms uh, uh, right away the, the larger of the two effects uh, at, that there is something. It may not be, we don't know yet to what precision or accuracy, but nonetheless that there is a, a non-Newtonian non-Newtonian effect working on these gyroscopes. Um, you will notice that there are bumps and wiggles in, in each of the gyroscopes. They're not straight lines. And these uh, bumps and wiggles uh, have required a much more sophisticated understanding of the gyroscope and um, analysis that allows us to separate out those uh, what turn out to be classical effects from the, the general slope which you see, which is the relativity. So 
What is the challenge then, in, in a little bit more detail, to, to be able to uh, see, uh, to, to make good measurements of these two predicted effects of relativity? We need a gyroscope that's uh, millions of times better than the best mo model gyroscope uh, previously made. Um, we need a telescope. Why do we need a telescope? If you have a spinning object and, and you're trying to measure its orientation, you need to have a reference. You need to be able to say it's moving or not moving relative to something. And, and that something, in our case, is a uh, nearly fixed distant star that is sighted by a tracking telescope. And so that telescope needs to track uh, whatever star you're talking about or, or uh, sighting a, a thousand times better than the best previous tracking telescope. And then finally, you need to have a way of measuring the spin axis of the gyroscope. Um, and the gyro readout needs to be able to be calibrated to uh, parts in 10 to the fifth, meaning that like any electronic device or many electronic devices, you get a voltage out, right? And how does one know how to convert that voltage into an angle for the gyroscope? You need to have a, a way to do that. It needs to be uh, rigorous and, and extremely accurate. We achieve these things um, by two primary uh, applications of technology. One is we operate in space, and so that reduces certain classes of uh, gyro drift uh, because there's, there's less um, force acting on, on the gyroscope. And secondly, um, we make use of cryogenics. Uh, and um, cryogenics uh, provide uh, magnetic advantages in terms of readout and shielding, thermal advantages, and uh, ultra-high vacuum is facilitated. So here's a, a picture of the GPB gyroscope. Um, it is uh, a round um, quartz sphere um, coated with a superconductor, niobium. Uh, it is uh, suspended inside of a cavity, um, two pieces here and here. Um, it's spun to 60 to 80 hertz. It rotates 60 or 80 times a second um, by using uh, helium gas that flows in this channel. And, and it's read out with uh, a London moment readout, which is um, very low noise. I'm not going to go through the, uh, the, really the mathematics here, but the, the thing I want to stress is, is that um, one can think of the gyroscope really as, as a top. Okay? And, and the question is, uh, how much is the top going to, its spin axis going to move due to um, gravity acting on it, classical gravity, not anything uh, beyond that. And, and it turns out that um, there are two things to, to really consider. Uh, one is how lopsided, lopsided is the, the gyroscope, and that's uh, quantified by a delta R. This, this delta R is the difference in the uh, mass center of the object and its geometrical center. So if it were a perfect sphere, that delta R would be zero. And there would be no um, drift due to um, the, the, uh, the geometry. The other is how much force is acting on the gyroscope. How much is force is required to to hold up that gyroscope. On the ground, it would be 1G. Um, it's the same force uh, that's keeping you in your chair right now, right? That's what's holding you here. In space, the uh, force is dramatically reduced. And in fact, we go through some special means to, to reduce the force acting on the gyroscope even below that of what a normal satellite would have. The, uh, and and by, so by combining 
um, a, a very small delta R by making the gyroscope very round and by making use of uh, what's called a drag-free spacecraft, we're able to um, arrive at a requirement for the gyroscope that's achievable. On the ground, it would take um, a delta R of over R of 10 to the minus 18, which is subatomic. Uh, and by combining these two technologies, we are able to uh, get the uh, delta R requirement to something that's achievable. Okay? And, and here you see uh, some of the actual on orbit uh, measurements which, which verify that. Um, the um, gyroscope's um, mass on balance, the delta R. Uh, so m remember, you have a, a ping pong ball sized object and on orbit, we verified the uh, gyroscopes. There's four of them for redundancy. Verified the uh, um, mass unbalance, this delta R, to a, a, about 10 nanometers. So a ping pong ball is spherical to 10 nanometers. And likewise, um, the drag free uh, system worked um, really as planned. What this drag free does is rather than the spacecraft uh, orbiting the Earth uh, and subject to external forces such as solar wind, um, atmospheric drag that would cause the gyroscopes to feel a larger support force, the gyroscope is actually unsuspended and we force the spacecraft to fly around the gyroscope. Okay. And so we sense where the gyroscope is and the, gy the spacecraft chases it. And by doing so, the, the uh, external perturbing effects due to drag and solar wind, and, and there are some others as well, are negated. Mm -hmm. So there are four gyroscopes in four orbits. Right, there are. OK, so what that gives rise to is a gravity gradient effect. OK, the gravity here and here are not exactly the same. But fortunately, the distance separating the gyroscopes is sufficiently small that um, the resulting forces on the three gyroscopes, only one of the four gyroscopes is truly drag free. Okay, the other three do have to be suspended, but, but because this, the distance separating the gyroscopes is so small, that support force uh, is still uh, acceptable. You follow what I'm saying? And anyone else, you have questions as we go along, I'm happy to answer. Yes? Why is the uh, unbalanced measurement different pre-launch and on orbit? Um, the, the difference is that pre-launch, all we could provide were upper limits. The, mass imbalance of the gyroscope was the sum of the underlying material, the quartz, plus the mass imbalance of the metal coating. Okay? And, and we, but unfortunately we didn't make, we couldn't tell the orientation of each of the two separate mass imbalances. So the quartz mass imbalance maybe was a vector like this, the um, metal coating like this, but all we could do was to say it can't be uh, worse than this. Okay. In, in practice, of course, they're typically going to cancel each other to some extent. And that's what you see with the on-orbit um, numbers. They came in quite a bit lower. And in this case, lower is better. Okay. So. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, r requirements in detail. These are different things that we had to achieve to allow us to push down the uh, Newtonian drifts to an acceptable level. Needless to say that many years of effort were required to achieve each of these um, uh, uh, technology advances. Um, 
I've already said uh, a bit about the mass imbalance and drag free. Likewise, you can have uh, an, uh, a drift due to the um, rotor asphericity. That's to be distinguished from the mass imbalance. This is the geometry on the outside of the rotor rather than the mass properties. If you have large magnetic fields, you can get magnetic torques. So we had to limit the magnetic fields. If you have um, excessive gas pressure in and about the gyroscope, it can give rise to uh, dissipative uh, forces and torques uh, that would corrupt the measurement. Electric charge um, gives rise to forces and, and potentially torques. And this last one, electric dipole moment, is in yellow because that is what gave rise in, to those wiggles we saw in the data. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but it's uh, important to have on the list here because that really was the, the driver that caused us to really need to dig into the data quite deeply to, to figure out what was going on. So I've talked now about the first challenge, the gyroscope. The, the second, the telescope uh, picture is shown here. This is what's used to um, sight the um, guide star and um, pen's giving out if there's another one. Adrian. Um, the, the telescope uh, sights the guide star and um, the gyroscopes are then referenced to it. It's a, a differencing telescope with uh, a beam splitter uh, that, that basically uh, gives two images in each axis. And the spacecraft is servoed so that it keeps the light on each half equal. And so if we start wandering off, then one side gets more light and the spacecraft then uh, corrects that, okay? So that's how the um, vehicle uh, is kept pointed and, uh, at the star. Um, so the third challenge makes use of the uh, so-called London moment uh, readout. This is based upon squ uh, squids, which is what I did my PhD thesis on. Um, and what we're really measuring in, in all of this is this ma angle mu, which is the, uh, the misalignment of the gyro spin axis um, relative to the uh, spacecraft roll axis. Um, and um, the other thing to, uh, to keep in mind or to understand is that the um, spacecraft is rolling about the line of sight to the star, okay? So it's, it's doing this, rather, and that has the advantage of um, averaging out some of the uh, torques that might still exist on the gyroscopes. If there's a little mass on balance, it'll tend to average out if you go around and around. And also, it causes the signal that comes out of the uh, squid to be at the roll frequency rather than at very nearly zero frequency. And, and that uh, is a significant advantage in terms of uh, processing the data and in reducing the noise. So this is how the, the calibration is done. It it's made, makes use of uh, what's called aberration, and um, what that is is a um, the, the guide star. In fact, any star will its apparent position will be shifted um, due to transverse velocity of the observer. So the GPB spacecraft is orbiting the uh, Earth. At the poles, there's the uh, velocity vector is towards the star, so there's no aberration. And, and you see that in the upper left in the uh, figure. Um, when we reach this point, then the aberration signal is at a maximum. Um, and you see uh, the, uh, the signal 
reflected uh, in the bottom figure. And then as we go towards the South Pole, uh, the aberration signal again returns to zero and the signal coming out of the readout um, is, is again uh, reduced. The, if you look closely, you see uh, the uh, line of data going up and down quite rapidly. That's the effect of the roll of the spacecraft. If there were no roll, the data would look like this. But with the roll, it, it's modulated at the roll frequency. It brings the frequency up to, to the roll rate, which is 77 and a half seconds. Okay. So here, is, uh, here are some pictures of launch, both before and after. Um, and just to give you a, a little personal anecdote, the, uh, I, I went up this, the launch tower about a week before launch, and the rocket was already there. Everything was set to go for one final look. I was at the launch uh, site about the time this picture was taken. It's really quite a feeling to be 140 feet up in the air knowing that you have a uh, 400,000 pound thrust rocket beneath your feet. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of a nervous experience, but uh, it, it all went well. Right. Okay, so we launched April 20th. Um, we set up the experiment for the next 128 days, uh, took science data for not quite a year, and then did uh, about six weeks of post-science calibrations. We operated the vehicle out of uh, the Stanford Mission Operations Center. There's a picture of it there in the lower right. Uh, and uh, we had uh, about an issue a day uh, during the setup phase, and uh, those issues were worked offline in uh, the, what we call the anomaly room. Um, and uh, it, it's really quite, quite interesting. The, the, my, my boss, Francis Everett, the PI of the program, described the uh, operations center and the language and the uh, way it all worked almost as theater uh, because there's a very specific language that has to be used and um, it, it all uh, almost seems scripted uh, at times. When you say language, what do you mean? Well, um, for communication with the NASA ground stations, there's a very rigid protocol that's required to, for efficiency's sake. And, and in fact, that same uh, rigorousness really went beyond just the communication with the ground station. It also uh, played out in the way people in the operations center uh, communicated with one another. Um, the one thing that is obvious, but when you actually live it, you, you come to understand is that the vehicle goes on no matter what, you know, and, and so you have to really keep up with it. And, and that, this room is what's keeping it alive. And the commands that are issued are, are really what, uh, you know, allows it to collect the data that you need. And so if there are issues, they have to be worked offline and you have to allow the mission operations folks to keep uh, tabs on the uh, vehicle. And uh, so it, it's, a, it's a somewhat formal process that, that one uses to, to do that. The other corollary to this is that probably more, more than half the problems occurred when we were all at home in bed. And so we, if a problem came up, we'd have to we get paged and have to come in and, uh, and tend to whatever the issue was. So this is what we were expecting the data perhaps to look like. Nice straight lines. Uh, the uh, larger of the two effects, the geodetic effect there, and then the smaller of the two, the frame dragging on below. The, the scales are different, so that's why the slopes don't, don't seem more different than they actually are. But uh, so, so that's what 
we uh, might have expected. Um, and, and this is actually what we found in the raw data. And um, unlike many talks where people will show you their best data, this is actually the, the most challenging of the four gyroscopes. Okay? But, it, but it, it shows just how much we had to uh, really understand to be able to change this into, into that. Okay? Um, and, we, and we never got quite as, as quiet or as straight as we had originally hoped, but we, we were able to um, make statements about both of these uh, relativistic effects uh, by, by the end of our data analysis process. And I'll, I'll walk you through that now. That's really what I'll be talking about for the next 15 or 20 minutes. So there were... Is it gyro to an average, or is it an anomaly, or...? Well, uh, gyro 2 um, had l larger um, torques than... Uh, some of the other gyroscopes, but all three of the gyroscope displayed each of these uh, effects and to lesser or greater degrees played a role in their analysis. Um, it's just that gyro 2 uh, had, had the most dramatic uh, of, of the three, and so that's why I showed it. Okay. But, but they, all had, they all operated with the same physics. So um, the gyro readout, as I said earlier, was based upon the London moment. Um, and um, that readout combines what's called the London moment, which is um, a dipole field with a trap field, which is based upon individual pieces of magnetic flux trapped into the rotor surface. Well, what we found is instead of a um, a fixed uh, scale factor over the course of a mission, which is what we were expecting. Um, that is the length of this remaining constant over the year. In fact, it varied. And so that scaling, which uh, we want to make relative to aberration, is changing. So it won't always be one volt per arc second. Due to this effect, it's going to slowly change over the mission. Okay. So here's a picture of gyro 1, and this colorful map is a map of the flux lines that are caught in the rotor surface, and those flux lines are the things that will change the length of this little blue vector. Okay? So, so that's what um, the, the trap field looks like, and this is really the first step in understanding of, of what the scale factor will do. And, I'll walk you through that. The gyroscope undergoes what's called pole hold motion. If you imagine this pointer as a gyroscope, then what we're doing is we're spinning the uh, gyroscope like so. Okay. Now, because the um, the gyroscope uh, has a, a little bit of dissipation in it. The spin axis may not change, but what will happen is that over time, the spin axis will change in the body. Okay, we're still spinning at exactly the same spot. Okay, I'm still spinning at the third lady in the front row here. Okay, but it's not the same with respect to the pointer, right? I started out like this, spinning at her, and over time, I was spinning like this, okay? That's what this pole hold path is, is going to do in the gyroscope, okay? So it starts off spinning, moving as shown in the figure, and then um, and generating that particular scale factor profile, but over the course of weeks and months, that, that pole hold path, that wobble, 
is moving in the body of the gyroscope. Mm -hmm. That's Newtonian. That's right. No, does, and requires no torque. Mm -hmm. You mean the the ac actual pole that is what the that the sphere is rotating around? The actual pole shifts. The spin axis does not shift. So the spin axis does not. I'm spinning right at you right now, right? But I could also be spinning the pen like this. And I'm still spinning right at you. Right? The, the spin axis is like this. The spin axis is just like this. Either way, it's the same spin orientation. There's no, no change in the spin axis, no torque. But, but, but still, something has happened in the body. Okay? In this. Okay? That's what's happening with the gyroscope. But because there are these trapped field lines on the gyro, the, the trapped field that couples to the readout is different this way than it is this way. Okay. That's due to the thin film coating? It's, it's little trapped field lines in the thin film coating. The London moment, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the London moment because the London moment is due to the spin speed. As long as you have the same spin speed this way and this way, it, it doesn't affect the London moment. So there was no difficulty there. It was in the trap field that we had to figure out how to get the correct analysis to get this slowly varying um, scale factor. And you see that it's over the course of many months that this evolution occurs. Okay? Did you know that going in or did you discover it from the data? What we knew going in is that there would be pole holding. But what we had thought is that the pole holding would be fixed over the year. And so there would have been no change. And so it allowed us to simply average things. As it was, this slowly changing uh, behavior uh, required much more deep analysis. And there was no book to tell us what to do. It's not it's really a, figure it out as you go. <clears throat> and so by the end of the mission, here we have for gyroscope one, um, the, the, the final uh, orientation. And you see that the uh, variation is, is almost damped out. Because while if you have a, a lot of motion, you're going to get a lot of variation in the scale factor. By the end, it's, it's almost all damped out. And, and so you, you basically have no, almost no variation. So um, were you able to go back afterwards and kind of look at the theory and say, if you, if you had thought about this effect, would, 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 would the theory predict that this is the exact pattern that the whole world motion would follow? Or? Um, well, certainly we, we did uh, some numerical tests which showed that, confirmed that this is the uh, understanding is correct, and also some theoretical analysis of the torques and all of that. Um, if you're asking whether we could have done things differently to avoid it, um, uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not trying to be unfair. I say unfair, but I just kind of trust that you know you can always, as a skeptic, you always come in and say, well, there could be thermal variations that lead to these slopes, or there could be this kind of variation that could lead to these slopes. And I guess, it, I guess, the hard part about this is kind of filtering all of those possibilities out. I think to make sure you're actually mapping truly just the uh, uh, gravitation. Yeah, the the, the, the this uh, effect that that I'm describing here had many other. Um, uh, there were many other data signals that were consistent with this, that, that all pointed in the same direction. I don't, don't have time to go through those all here, but um, I think we're very confident that, that we understand the source of this and, and how to uh, analyze it and deal with it in the, ana in the uh, data analysis. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not familiar Uh -huh. So is that a literature-based something, or it's just named after something? No, no. Pol pole hold is something that um, is, is part of uh, studying classical mechanics. It's um, just, it's the, in the study of rigid body motion, the um, uh, pole hold motion is, is part of that uh, understanding. It's, it's, not, it's not specific, really, to gyroscopes.
to, to GPB gyroscopes. Yep. Uh, after, after the fact, do you think that it would have been possible, say, instead of having a uniform metal coating, say, lay down a pattern on metal coating or something that would prevent the You're you saying a, a, code, a, a, a pattern coating? Yes. Yeah, um, there, there um, was work early on um, to uh, consider an optical readout where you would have bands of, of uh, material that would uh, provide uh, reflection to a, a laser-based system. Um, and um, I mean, there, I don't want to go into all the details of the pros and cons, but, but certainly that had certain uh, you know, advantages, perhaps most notably not operating at low temperature, which is a significant complication. With a London moment readout, you need to have a continuous uh, film so you generate the signal and um, uh, get the proper readout. Okay. How do you accomplish the readout without affecting the, the uh, chiro? No, oh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, the gyro housing had what we call a pickup loop. You can think of it like an antenna. And the magnetic signal, so there's no touching between the, the readout and the uh, gyroscope. The readout system uh, basically just measured the magnetic field around the gyroscope which provides the, the London moment signal and the scale factor. And so by uh, using this, this approach, there was, I wouldn't say zero uh, influence, but it was at an acceptably low level. So you had a measurable low influence. It's an unmeasurably low influence because it's so small. But, but it, it, you're right, it's not exactly zero. In fact, a any measurement, so it's one of the, it's a, a very uh, uh, fundamental aspect of uh, measurement theory in physics is any measurement will cause some uh, effect on, on what's being measured. Okay, so the way in which we do the mathematics for the determining the scale factor uh, through trap, is through trap flux mapping. Um, and uh, it's based upon the use of spherical harmonics. Uh, we represent the magnetic potential with spherical harmonics. We do some transformations. Uh, and then um, there are uh, Nonlinear estimates of the rotor dynamics that allow you to uh, to get the uh, coefficients that define the um, um, trapped field. Um, and uh, the proof is really in the pudding. Uh, the there are two lines here. One is the uh, predicted uh, from the um, trap flux mapping from this, the pretty color map that you see on the lower right. And uh, the other are the actual raw data. And so you see just how precisely the theory uh, maps onto the actual data. Um, a second uh, on-orbit finding was uh, what we call the misalignment torque. This is a Newtonian or classical torque. And um, the uh, torque is in a direction perpendicular to the gyro misalignment. You remember that misalignment angle from the uh, earlier slide where that had that angle theta, which is the uh, angle separating the spin axis direction of the gyroscope from the roll axis of the space vehicle. Um, this this it, misalignment torque it acts perpendicular to that angle, okay? And so the data that you see here um, show um, the misalignment vector in the light color and then the misalignment uh, torque perpendicular. And, and this applied to all four of the gyroscopes. 
A, a very strange uh, torque that we discovered is the third major finding for the uh, data. And uh, this is a graph showing the orientation of uh, gyro 2 over the course of uh, a, a couple of weeks. And what we found is that when the pole load period matched up uh, with the roll period, actually harmonically related, there was a shift in the gyro orientation. And you see these steps that occur precisely uh, at, at those times. And, and, um, and so the analysis required that we understand these all intrinsically. Uh, so that we could separate them from the relativity. Okay, it's not a matter of just doing ad hoc modeling. We, we, because we're doing a physics experiment, we have to be able to, uh, in a rigorous way, s explain what these wiggles are. Otherwise, we wouldn't believe and we wouldn't expect the community to believe that we've made a measurement of relativity. Well, after uh, quite a bit of number crunching with the on-orbit data, we went and, and did some additional investigations that we had started prior to launch. And we just uh, concluded that um, electrostatic patches on the rotor surface and the housing surface, so a potential here, certain voltage, and a, relative to another s surface on the housing, caused both forces and, and also the observed torques to emerge. And the potential differences that we're talking about are tens of millivolts, just to give you an, an idea. So well under one volt uh, separating the two surfaces. And you get a kind of a pictorial view here. The uh, rotor uh, and housing are not perfectly smooth electrically. They have these uh, patches. And so again, with the pole hold motion modulating the orientation of the gyroscope relative to the housing, one could easily uh, imagine how the forces and the torques would be uh, modulated over time uh, as well. Okay, so we go through uh, a, a, a outline of an analysis which allows us to separate out these torques from the uh, relativistic effects uh, by uh, again doing a spherical harmonic expansion, uh, again doing uh, frame rotations, uh, and then solving Laplace's equation for the gap between the uh, rotor and housing, and um, in addition, in the case of the patch-induced uh, torques, we take advantage of the un our understanding of the rotor's orientation that we acquired by doing the trapped flux mapping. In, in that process, we were able to really get a handle on what the rotor was doing, and so we can feed that into the, this part of the analysis. Uh, to, to unravel the patch effect uh, influences. So here are the equations that derive from all that I just said. Um, the first term there is the relativity. It's just a constant over time. If there were nothing else, it, it would result in the, the straight lines that we had once imagined. There's the misalignment torque, um, which is um, the first of the two torques, and then the uh, second of the two torques, the roll resonance. And so the whole analysis comes into uh, really quantifying each of these three terms. So, um, Without going into to great depth here, uh, I, I think the thing to emphasize is that the theory, based upon the, those words that I had just uh, gone through, give a nice spiral, uh, it's called a Cornu spiral, and you see that in the lower right. 
It's, it's the same spiral you get is if you start at the North Pole of the Earth and you go out at a certain heading around the North Pole, you'll wind your way south and then eventually you'll get to the Southern Hemisphere and wind back in the other direction until you eventually reach the South Pole. It's the same spiral. In any case, um, the theory is, is what you see in the lower right and um, the data are, are shown here and except for a little bit of noise in the readout system you see that the two uh, agree quite well. So this is um, something that would be, uh, might, might sound uh, uh, like a little bit hard to believe that you have this gyroscope doing these, all these strange effects as it's orbiting uh, 600 kilometers above the Earth, but in fact, the data complete, re really do confirm it. Um, we developed a, a geometric uh, understanding of the misalignment <coughs> torque that allowed us to uh, separate the two in a very uh, clean fashion. Um, and um, the, the way uh, this works is that the misalignment torque is constantly being changed in orientation relative to the relativity because the misalignment is not fixed, whereas the relativity is. And so by uh, taking advantage of that um, effect, we're able to separate out the uh, relativity from, from the misalignment torque. Um, on orbit, we had um, nine major what we call anomalies. These are times when we lost uh, the guide star uh, in, in the telescope. Um, there were uh, solar flares, there were computer reboots, and, and uh, similar types of events. Um, and, and the thing that's important to, to realize about this is then it breaks our lines. We're, we're not going to get a single line, straight or otherwise, it's going to be 10 smaller pieces that we then patch together. And so if you look at the, these uh, results from the four gyroscopes, you see uh, 10 uh, ellipses for each gyroscope, or in some cases, of, in some cases just eight ellipses, but in any case, each ellipse for each gyroscope gives you a, an error uh, uh, ellipse for the um, orientate for the uh, drift for that particular gyroscope. So the north south and the east west are plotted with uncertainties, and so those ellipses are the uncertainty for that particular piece of data for that particular gyroscope. Okay. And, and so the first thing you see is that all the ellipses in general overlap with one another and that's a good thing because we're trying to measure, make a single measurement of the relativity and, and so the fact that you have um, some 40 ellipses all in agreement is, is a good thing. If you had gyro 1 giving a different result than gyro 2, you wouldn't know really what to make of that. Okay. So what we can do is uh, take the individual uh, segments for each of the four gyroscopes and combine them. And, and when you do that, then you get four ellipses. You get one result for each of the four gyroscopes. Okay, So you take the 10 segments, you combine it, all the data together, and, and you get these uh, four ellipses. And you see, um, again, that they overlap. You can then take the, another step further and combine the four gyroscopes into a single result, okay? And, and that's the black ellipse, okay? And, and the reason the ellipse gets smaller is that when you combine the data, you're actually adding information, and so you reduce the uncertainty. And so now I've just replotted that previous black circle here. So that's the statistical uncertainty. It comes just from the noise in the measurement. We have to add to that 
the sensitivity that we have in our model. So we have a, a whole bunch of, of terms that go into the model. And how do you know that your result is not sensitive to the number of terms that you use? Well, you could increase the number of terms or decrease the number of terms or leave certain things out. In any case, if you do all that, you, you develop what's called a sensitivity analysis. And, and each of the dots that you see uh, in the figure on the right is the result of, a, of an analysis of the full year of data repeated. Um, and we did that 10,000 times with different combinations of, of parameters. Okay, so 10,000 years of analysis. But fortunately, computers are faster these days, so we were actually able to do it um, in a reasonable period of time. That scatter that results in those points gives you an idea of how sensitive your result is to the way you're doing the modeling. Um, and ideally, you would have almost no impact on, on the final result. In practice, it does have some effect. And, and so we need to include that sensitivity in what our overall error is for the experiment. Okay? And, and so this is what the combined uncertainty is for uh, the, the measurement. And then just to, by way of comparison, uh, I've removed now all of those sensitivity results. The GR prediction is, is shown there. And so you see that the experiment result uh, is uh, consistent with the GR prediction uh, and to, uh, to three sigma. So. It's a 95 percent confidence. So, just to summarize, why do we believe this result? We used only physics-based models. There was nothing really ad hoc. There is clear separability of the relativity from the classical effects. Um, there is verification through the consistency of the results, the gyro to gyro and segment to segment, uh, they all pointed in the same direction. Um, the parameter sensitivity was run uh, 10,000 different cases, and um, the result is not from any one particular run, but the average over all of them. Um, and we had agreement between two intrinsically different ways of analyzing the data. So they all, uh, all of these things uh, increased our confidence. And, and something I didn't talk about, but is an important cross check, is, is that the, um, we, we made an independent verification of the gravitational deflection of starlight. The first um, verification of general relativity in 1919, we were able to reproduce here with a much more complicated and expensive uh, apparatus, but nonetheless was consistent, so uh, giving additional confidence. Um, and then uh, just, just to, to conclude, this is uh, taken from Einstein's The Meaning of Relativity, where I quote him, these effects which are to be expected in accordance with Mach's ideas are actually present according to our theory, although their magnitude is so small that confirmation of them by laboratory experiments is not to be thought of. <laughs> now, um, many things can be said about NASA, but it's really due to their uh, uh, sticking with us uh, at Stanford that we were actually not only to think about these experiments, but to actually uh, build the hardware and uh, do, the, do the measurement. So with that, I'll conclude and open it up to questions. Thanks very much, Barry. Can you just go back to your statistics um, uh, slide? This one? So yeah, you didn't simply add in this systematic uncertainty, clearly, because you know, these right. are. So can you give us some insight into how you weighted the systematic uncertainty relative? Yeah, right. So the, the weighting is um, 
done through a, a whole separate process. The simple way you might think about doing it would be just a simple RSS. And, and so if you did that, you would actually get some sense of the, uh, how, how things scale. With RSS, if, 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 since th this 5 milliarc seconds is much less than the 32, it's going to have a, a very small effect on uh, the uncertainty here, whereas the 4.6 proportionally is, is a bigger fraction of the 6.8, and so that's why you, you get a, a larger impact. In fact, one has to go, th one has to do um, a number of, 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 uh, of steps to actually get the, the final results, because there's, each of the gyros is considered separately and then brought in. And so, um, but, but to first order, one can think of it as, as just how you would RSS the, the numbers. Okay. So, so um, this was a good oh, sorry. 95%. No, sorry, could we just follow the, sorry, sorry. I'll get to you. Um, as, as you know, one of the issues within NASA technology and space programs is freezing of the technology well before launch. Gravity Pro B must have, have suffered that or dealt with it in a more extreme way than almost any other project. Can you comment on the evolution of, of the technology over the decades? Yeah, in fact, when GPB first started, the, a number of the technologies, most notably the, the readout technology, had not yet really, it was not feasible. Um, it hadn't, the, the, uh, the underlying hardware had, had not ever been built, and, and that really goes across the board for um, much of the, the hardware. There were never, no one had ever built a gyroscope at the level that was required. And, um, it, it took uh, hundreds of people, uh, almost 50 years, to uh, build the, the hardware that allowed us to, to do the measurement. Um, and. Uh, it was uh, an equal challenge to keep NASA on board uh, to, um, to allow us to actually achieve the final result. Um, we were canceled and then reinstated six or seven times uh, over the course of many years because of, of funding shortfalls within NASA. So it was a challenge both technically and politically to, to keep this uh, you know, to the, to the end. I have a question about how the guide star was chosen. I presume it's many light years away and has a small parallax and small proper motion. Right. How, how far away was the guide star? Um, actually, Dan Lieback is here, uh, and who is from the Smithsonian uh, 100 parsecs, but um, <laughs> There was a whole rigorous process that had to be go, gone through. Parallax in it by itself is not a hard issue because it's, we, once you know the distance, yeah. everything it falls in place. But Dan, do you want to say just a few words about the many factors that went into the selection? Sure. Um, real, real quickly. Um, first of all, um, you're right that, well, proper motion, it's not so much the, what the magnitude of the proper motion is, but how well you can measure it. If you can measure it accurately, independently, then it doesn't matter how big it is, really. Um, so one of the major constraints on the guide star was that the only way, in, uh, with the original uh, expectations of the measurement accuracy of the GPB, um, the relativity measurement, required the star to be, um, the only way we could measure proper motion so accurately was with radio techniques, and specifically something called very long baseline interferometry. And that required the star to be radio bright. So that was probably the, the most stringent condition is we had to find a star that we could actually measure using this uh, VLBI, very long baseline interferometry technique. The other, the other major factors were basically the position of the star. You wanted it in a place where you could, um, uh, you wanted it sort of near the equatorial plane to get the maximum six, the maximum um, frame dragging signal and things like that. You had issues about um, about uh, spacecraft energy, how you how you position the solar panels. There are all these all these constraints that sort of limited where in the sky the star could be. So that plus plus the radio signal were the main factors in determining the guide star. 
Thanks, Dan. And it had to be bright enough for the telescope to track it. That's another. <laughs> Uh, to show my ignorance, what's the difference between what this does and what you can do with LIGO? Um, so, so LIGO is a, a ground-based, um, laser-based uh, gravitational wave detector. Okay? The, um, the measurement here is not really of gravitational waves, but of, of different manifestation of uh, general relativity. Would this not show a gravitational wave if one came through? Or uh, I'm sorry? Would this not show a gravitational wave if it was detected? It, it, it really would not. Um, what we're really sensitive to here are these two uh, very subtle uh, effects do, causing drift in the gyroscope. I mean, I, it, so, so, um, so that, those are really the difference. There's another uh, space-based um, gravitational wave uh, detector that's uh, envisioned called LISA. And there, LISA and LIGO are, are much more similar. They're both detecting gravitational radiation. This is not. In general, not only related to this satellite, in general, how do you deal with buildups of static electricity and things like that, or even magnetic moments that might appear? I mean, is it there doesn't seem to be any easy way to discharge static electricity in space. I don't know. No, that's, that's a very good question. Um, the, and what makes it even more difficult is that the gyro is not touching anything, right? So, you know, if, if you're charged up and you touch a light switch, you discharge, uh, unpleasantly or otherwise. But with the gyroscope, what we had to do was to build a discharge system. Um, and uh, Bruce Clark, who is, I think, here, was the uh, guy who actually uh, played a very central role in, um, in building that system. And in effect, what that did by use of um, light plus um, uh, electro photo emission, we're able to control the electric charge so that it remained very nearly zero through the course of the mission. Um, as far as the magnetics are concerned, um, the way one achieves a low magnetic field in the rotor is by requiring that the magnetic field in its ambient environment be low. And that required the use of what was called lead bag, expanded lead bag technology, which took the roughly one gauss Earth's field that the rotor would otherwise trap and reduced it to 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7 gauss. And so again, not an easy thing to do, but with you know, all of this effort through the years we were able to achieve. Uh, when you were talking about uh, the aberration, um, I think I heard you mention that the position of the guide star seemed to move slightly mm -hmm. when the transverse velocity was high. Right. Uh, what was the physical reason for that effect? Um, this was uh, due originally to Bradley. It's, it's something that was known since the 18th century. And, and the way you can think about it, as the light comes in the front of the telescope, the telescope is, is moving relative to the beam of light. It's, it's going to cause the telescope to actually misread where the light is, is coming from. And it's typically a very small uh, uh, amplitude because the transverse velocity is tens of kilometers per second, whereas the speed of light is um, 10 to the you know, eighth or whatever. If, Na if, NASA, if NASA had some extra money and wanted you to do this over again, what, how would you design it differently the next time? Um, I think the one thing that we would 
do is probably work on the coatings of the gyroscope to see if we could reduce the impact of the patch potentials on, on the torques. Here, I have a question about the, the pole hold resonances. I mean, this is classical physics, after all, what's going on here. My understanding from a ways back was that if you looked theoretically at the effects of these high harmonics on, on you know, what, how they would perturb the gyros, that, that the theoretical effect is orders of magnitude lower than what you, that was, maybe I'm remembering wrong, was much lower than what you're actually seeing. And I'm, no. is, is that not true? No, in fact, uh, these 40, I forget how high the resonance is. John, John Tenor and Sasha Buckman just recently published a paper in RSI. And it's kind of dense, but I suggest you go there. And, and in fact, what they basically s conclude is that all of the on-orbit effects, including these two uh, torques and a number of other things I didn't talk about, are all consistent with uh, 50 millivolt type patches on the rotor and housing. Uh, you, s you didn't quite uh, get into specifics about this on the historical side, but uh, there have been other uh, um, measurements of uh, geodetic and, and uh, frame dragging effects uh, before GPP was uh, launched. And maybe you can sort of uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh. Sure. Um, right. So there, there have been measurements um, of various types. I showed the picture, for example, of the jets, which is attributed to, to frame dragging. Um, the, there are measurements um, of these effects, but with different systems, okay? So one, one can say uh, there is a measurement done by Lagios, which is uh, a different type of, of space mission to, to measure the frame dragging effect. And in that case, they're looking at the uh, change in the orbital plane of uh, spacecraft. I think the thing to stress is that in ph physics is a uh, experimental science. And so there has not been, before GPB, a measurement of orbiting uh, gyroscopes uh, and the impact of general relativity on, on those uh, gyroscopes. And so th there have been, comp I, what I would say is there have been complementary measurements of the geodetic effect um, and, and of the frame dragging effect. And if there's also um, a framework that some people use that allows these different, seemingly different measurements to all be put into a, a, a given context. It's called the PPN theory, post-Newtonian uh, uh, parameterization of, of, uh, of gravity. And in that context, one can compare the change of, of an orbit plane to a gyroscope motion or compare the precession of Mercury to the geodetic precession that we see um, in the GPB gyroscopes. But there, there's something intrinsically important, I think, about doing measurements on different physical systems um, and, and seeing how the results come out. Because that's, in, in the end, as an experimentalist, what we, what we do, whether it's in the laboratory and our physical lives, we experience things, we measure things, and, and from that we come up with these theories. Uh, just one other question is, uh, when, is, this is not intrinsically difficult, different from an experiment, say, just uh, from, uh, say, a, a, a natural observation of two orbiting uh, neutron stars. Uh, could this uh, be tested? Uh, um, well, orbiting neutron stars would first and foremost would give rise to gravitational radiation. Um, they, they give rise to periodic gravitational radiation. And in fact, the Nobel Prize was awarded um, to uh, Taylor and Hulse uh, for their uh, observation of gravitational radiation from, from a binary system. And so, um, I, I don't think it would give you the same, you know, it, it's not, again, it's not a gyroscope uh, in orbit about a, a massive body. So 
I would say it's complementary and, and, and actually a very, was a very beautiful set of measurements done uh, and, and continue to be done. Oh, again, descending to error bars. Uh, so for the, the, the GR prediction, what, what's, what sort of error terms are, are error properties? For instance, your Earth model. Right. Um, the uncertainty in the uh, relativity prediction is a bit under a milliarc second per year. Okay, and it's, 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 it's included in in the numbers, but they're so small that they don't really have any effect because, again, it's not one out of 8.2. It's it's the square root of square root of 8.2 squared plus one squared, and, and it, it basically it, it, yeah, it just oh that dot yeah that dot it was basically a large enough font so that you know the audience could see it in a big room. So that's all. Okay, if we have um, any future questions, I'm, uh, I'm going to encourage people to come and t speak to the speaker. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, we have a uh, special SETI oh. mug in uh, commemoration of your talk, Barry. Oh, great. Please join me in thanking Barry for his great talk.